Yes, this is Amir Quintus' uh, uh, presentation. PI is Mara Quintus. Uh, if you're a guest, don't worry about this. Uh, if you're not, please come in. Thank you, Ian, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, today I'm going to present you guys with a very simple model for biological self assembly that our lab has been working on. Biological self-assembly is a process by which biological systems spontaneously adopt this 3D structure that then allows them to perform whatever their function is. And if this talk doesn't do anything else to you, I hope that at least it'll let like, you appreciate how amazing it is that biological systems spontaneously self-assemble. Because I'll tell you right now, it's not an easy process. And so, the biology is amazing for 16 minutes. So the first question is, what are self-assembly systems? As I mentioned, a self-assembly system is one that spontaneously adopts its 3D structure. So then you can ask, how does a system know what is that correct 3D structure, right? And the answer always has to do with um, stabilization. So the correct structure always has to have some chemical or physical property that ensure that it is more stable than any other structure, right? So this might be some sort of electrostatic interaction, hydrogen bonds. Um, so one uh, classic example of self-assembly is protein folding, which is the process by which a protein, which is a series of amino acids, spontaneously folds into the structure that allows it to do any role. And proteins, as you all know, are the workhorses of the cell. So they need to fold into the correct structure to have a function. And folding isn't well understood, but there has been some molecular dynamics simulations of the folding. And I want to show you a cool video of protein folding right now. Cool. So these side chains hanging out here are amino acids. These are the building blocks of protein. And you see how the protein doesn't immediately collapse, but actually it falls in small regions, um, small domains of its form one at a time. <laughs> exactly. Crap. Right. So okay, I'm gonna. I love the music, but I'm gonna have to pause it here for a second because. This is a very important moment, actually, in the video. The protein has now folded, but the structure it took on isn't actually the correct structure. As I said here, it's stuck in a non-native trap state. And that's a big deal I'm going to show you later, because this actually ends up being one of the biggest challenges in self-assembly, having to avoid these non-native states. So. so now we're getting the greater freedom of that non-native state, because it's not as stable as what's going to end up being the correct state. And now, finally, it looks like the protein is starting to fold correctly. More and more of these layers are being added. Only one part is missing right now. And now watch this. The, two, the kind of two main features that I want you to remember from this video are one, kind of the fact that the protein was stuck in that bottom state. That's going to be crucial later on as we understand these self assembling systems more generally. And the other is the fact that the protein didn't adopt any one structure right away, but kind of formed in a few domains at a time. First, you have an alpha helix form and then these sheets. And that also, as I'll show, is going to end up being very crucial universally, not just in protein folding. Um, so what are examples of protein folding uh, self-assembling systems? One is protein folding, of course. Um, then there's RNA folding. So RNA, um, actually, the ribosome, which makes proteins, is largely comprised of RNA. So the RNA has to somehow adopt a structure that allows it to translate from, uh, from mRNA to protein. Uh, then liquid bilayer is possible if it's assembled to form the cell membrane. Molecular motors are assemblies of proteins that come together to do things such as propelling a bacterium or even making a um, so a lot of you here hopefully are biologists, right? So you must like CRISPR very much. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm sure a lot of you have spent your whole summer doing stuff with CRISPR. Well, with CRISPR, it's nothing less than a self-assembly system, right? Because you have that target, that guide RNA, which needs to find its correct target in the genome. The question is, how does the target, the guide RNA, know what is the correct target in the genome? It's a self-assembly problem. And now the system that we've been focusing on is chromosome pairing, mm -hmm. which is the pairing of homologous chromosomes, for instance, as it occurs in meiosis. Um, one from the father must pair with one from the mother, or uh, in DNA repair, um, sometimes you have a damaged DNA structure, um, that a damaged DNA that performs homology repair and needs to find a homologous sequence to use as assembly for repair. So um, what are the requirements for a successful self-assembly system? Um, 
we talked about one of them, right? The correct configuration is most stable. So for example, in chromosome pairing, chromosome one must be most stable when it's paired with chromosome one from the mother. Father and mother one must be most stable. Uh, but then another problem, which is perhaps even the less understood problem, is you can't get stuck. So what that means is, say maybe this is chromosome one from the father and this is three from the mother. They might have some regions in which they match just by chance here and here. Um, but the thing is, that, that could be just by accident, but that's not actually the correct pairing. You don't want to get stuck with one next to three, otherwise it's just going to take too long for one to find one. Um, and I'm going to give you just, going back to the protein folding example, just um, some numbers to illustrate how big of a problem it is to get stuck. So uh, let's consider a protein in which each amino acid can only take on three configurations, which um, of course that's really hard to quantify how many configurations, but for simplicity let's assume maybe three, of which there could even be more. Um, now let's assume that this protein has 200 amino acids. What that means is that there are in total three to the 200 configurations, right? Um, so now the assumption is, let's say that while folding, the protein samples all the configurations available to it before it arrives at the right one, or maybe most of them. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, so and let's um, assume that this protein gets stuck in each of these wrong configurations only for a very small amount of time, only for an hour. Uh, not, not a lot of getting stuck, but you're getting stuck anyway. So that means it'll take 10 to the 86 seconds for the protein to fold into its native structure. And just for reference, on um, the age of the universe is 10 to the 17 seconds. So yeah, getting stuck is a bit of a problem. Um, so now what's the solution to not getting stuck and to folding correctly or self-assembly correctly in general? Going on these, right? Just like the solution, you might be wondering why we're talking about solution and anything else. Well, Let's say you're trying to uh, find your true match, whatever you call it. Um, so the way you do that, you don't get married to the first person you lay your eyes on, right? Otherwise, <laughs> you're stuck if you get married to the first person you lay your eyes on. You're stuck, it you, doesn't matter if you guys are in love or not, you're stuck. The only way out is to get a divorce, which involves getting a lawyer. Do you want to deal with a lawyer? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to deal with a lawyer. So, um, yeah, so don't get stuck. Um, <laughs> so, the way that the um, actual you know, human pairing happens and the way self-assembly happens is you sample a pairing, right? And if it's correct, if we can go maybe go on a first date, for instance. If it goes well, maybe you go on another date. At some point, you make it Facebook official, right? And then uh, a few more days afterwards, maybe after many years, you'll get engaged, right? And then you get married. And, um, so what, what's crucial there is you're kind of getting to know each other slowly at a time. And it turns out that ends up being very important in self-assembly system too. So in my system, our hypothesis for chromosome pairing goes as follows. So let's say two DNA molecules are testing each other to determine if they match, right? Um, so what happens is the two DNA molecules collide, generally collide at an angle. And in that small region around the collision, you can treat the DNA molecules as being rigid rods, both that simplifies the math, but also it's a valid approximation because DNA doesn't like to bend very much. It's so around that collision, you treat them as rigid rods. So the advantage of that kind of angle, the fact that they're not in parallel right away, is that um, let's say the sequences don't match. Then maybe even they do match, like far away from that collision. But if they don't match here, there's nothing pulling them together. So they just come apart completely, right? Um, but now let's say that they have a little bit of matching regions maybe around here. These are close enough that they will actually attract each other. We're assuming that in any self assembling system, there's something that provides you stabilization if you're uh, correct or getting more and more correct over time. So say these regions might attract each other, and the, the attraction will actually decrease the angle between the chromosomes, right? So now that gives you an opportunity to go on a second date, which involves testing the sites that are maybe a little farther away, right? And if these sites don't match, again, there's not much holding the chromosomes together, it's just maybe a little attraction, so they can still come off very easily. But now, if these regions do match, then the process kind of keeps repeating iteratively. Like, the angle gets smaller and smaller, more and more regions come into contact, until eventually the full match is sterile, or you can say you get married. Um, so that's kind of the final solution. And the advantage of this system is basically that uh, it ensures that these mismatches and these partial matches, even the ones that have some short regions of accidental homology, these don't get stuck with each other. Uh, they come off very easily, right? Don't have to deal with a lawyer or anything, just come across, come off. Uh, but that also ensures that the correct matches do in fact reach that stable state, which you absolutely want in a self-assembly system, right? So this all has been our hypothesis as to how DNA pairing works based on that angle and the fact that you test the multiple stages. So now how do, how do you confirm this hypothesis? Um, so one way to do it is kind of theoretically, seeing if this all works. So 
what we did, we built a mathematical model called the Markov chain, which describes the transition between these different angles and gives you, you have the probability of transitioning. It's basically like we're writing down chemical rate equations to try to see how we predict the system will evolve with time. I don't want to go too much into the nitty gritty of all of that, but I do want to show you a couple of these results. And these results are important to you. They confirm basically our hypothesis. So on this x-axis, you have um, the number of continuous homologous sites between the two rods, which is the number of sites that match. Beginning, so if it's zero, then you don't have any matching sites. Maybe you have some that match by accident farther away from that initial collision. So it's not next to the collision. Um, whereas if you have 17, then that means all of the sites on, um, are assumed to be homologous, and we're treating these as being truly matched rods. And so here we have the probability of pairing, which is the probability of coming into that parallel state. Um, and it's on a log scale, right? Um, so what we see here is that because of this kind of rotation uh, and this gradual testing in stages, then when you have a low amount of homology, you have much lower, many order two or more orders of magnitude lower probability of pairing than when you are a complete homolog, right? So that means that the stable homologs reach their final state, whereas these heterologs and mismatches do not reach that final state. Uh, and that difference in pairing is very substantial. I should say that these results are all normalized. We normalize them to the value here. So in fact, the homologs may not always um, actually reach that parallel state, so the probability may not quite be one. But we're just normalizing it to show the comparison between uh, heterolog and homolog. So um, the other question we can ask is, if you have, say, a gene, a DNA sequence that has undergone a double strand break, for instance, and wants to find a matching sequence to use as a template for a pair, how long might we expect the template to, or that molecule to find its template, given there are all these competing genes in the genome that might be similar in some regions? Um, so we did it kind of in the dimensionless time, basically. We tried to determine uh, more or less how long it would take. And what we found is that as long as your attraction, your stabilization between all of those matching sites is sufficiently strong, then this rotation, this you can say going on dates, will provide you an advantage relative to just if you were to get married every time, which means, which we're modeling as uh, in the blue curve. The rods just collide in parallel each time, so all the sites interact. And the bad thing about this one is you get stuck each time, right? So this is just saying that as long as you have sorry, enough attraction, um, then you're going to be able to, uh, then the homologs will pair, whereas the heterologs will come off very easily. And so uh, this model, these going on dates for finding different angles, helps you find your match more quickly than if you are just testing all the sites at any given time. Um, so what are the implications? Well, these are two rigid rods. It's like the simplest possible thing, really. I mean, we were modeling it off DNA, but it's, at the end of the day, our system so far is just two rigid rods. But the simplicity also makes it really attractive because um, the principle, first of all, it's very widely applicable in biological self-assembly, right? Anything that can roughly be modeled with two rigid rods and that self-assembles likely obey similar physical principles, right? And even just the bigger principles of not testing for homology all at one time and testing in these stages are very widely applicable, not only to biology, but also to nanotechnology and artificial self -assembly. There's a lot of, one of the biggest problems in nanotechnology is actually getting your thing to come together as you want it to, and not getting corrected. So I'll give you one example, is this really cool thing called DNA origami. So DNA, as it turns out, can be um, sculpted, basically, to make all sorts of cool shapes. If you use one strand that serves as like a template, and then the other that kind of guides along that other strand, you can make many, many different shapes. So there is nice smiley faces, some stars, I don't know what all these are, whatever. Um, <laughs> so um, there was even some talk of designing circuits, like nano circuits, using this DNA origami. And I was looking through the literature, and I saw a lot of papers, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, um, but 2010, 2011, I'm not really seeing any DNA origami anymore. And I was like, why not? So I spoke to my PI professor, Francis, and one of the big conclusions we reached is this isn't working very well. Why is it important here? Well, it's because the DNA is getting stuck in all the wrong ways that you don't want it to get stuck, right? That's a big problem, not just for DNA origami, but for all nanotechnology. And so what's important is that these principles of self-assembly might be able to inform the development of technologies, including DNA origami. But basically, we've developed this crucial theory that um, a self-assembly system should not test configurations all at one time, otherwise you're getting stuck. Rather, you should gradually test configurations so that if the configuration is incorrect, you come off very easily. Uh, but if it's correct, then you're able to reach that final state and you get the stabilization you need to have a durable product. 
So with that, I would like to thank some people I work with. Uh, thank you, Claudia Danilovitz and Laura Herman. Uh, thank you for coming, and also thank you for some very useful discussions. Um, thank you, Craig Kelly, who's also I've had great discussions with. Um, thanks to my collaborators, Aaron Levin and Wei Yin Chang, for uh, their contribution to the project. Thank you to my PI, my apprentice, for teaching me so much, uh, for giving me the opportunity to work in this lab and making me appreciate just how amazing self-assembly is, which I hope that I have conveyed on to you in turn. Um, thank you to Greg Lasser for your hard work organizing Pride. Um, thank you to the entire Pride community for an amazing summer. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. So is there a possibility of mismatching, not because the modules are properly mismatched, but just because it's bound to the wrong site? Uh, yes, that is. And that when we do those calculations of the search time, we supposedly account for all of those potential ways of mismatching. So that is a very valid way of being mismatched as well. Go ahead. Do you think something similar happens during mitosis when the entire chromosomes are trying to pair, uh, even though the DNA is not running? During mitosis, when entire chromosomes are trying to you're the longest one. Yeah, yeah, that meiosis was one of the original inspirations of the project. Meiosis and DNA repair. So absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a little more complicated, right? Because we're, we're not considering a lot of factors in DNA. Let's say the fact that you have these, um, oh, like, nucleosomes everywhere, the, the polymerases, I don't know, all these fancy proteins. We're just kind of considering the main physics, right? Which, because of DNA's rigid structure, we can make this argument. Um, but we do think meiosis was kind of one of our original motivations. The time scale of the video of Cody Holy Image, I think it was on the millisecond time scale. I think it's all made a bit about like I'm not completely sure about this, uh, but yeah, it says simulation of millisecond protein folding. So it was somewhere around that order. Sure. So one thing that I started working on actually with Fadia has been um, FRET experiments, which FRET, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a way of determining whether two molecules are paired. Um, and basically the way it works is you have um, these molecules that fluoresce, um, and you have the donor and receptor that takes that, uh, in the fluorescence and transfers it to an acceptor. So what that means is that when the molecules is paired, then you see less fluorescence in uh, one of the molecules because it's transmitting fluorescence to that other molecule. So you can actually use this as a way to track DNA pairing. You can test some of these principles. Like if we scatter accidental matches in different ways, um, what's the probability that they'll pair? And we can kind of take some inferences 